have chosen as one of the areas that we um, like working in and wanted to work in was corrections. And with the aging of the correctional population, uh, it's certainly, uh, we feel that we have our calling out there for doing this. So today, I uh, want to first of all let you know that we don't have any relevant financial relationships to disclose. We probably all wish we did. But uh, <laughs> these are the educational objectives for today's session. And I'm going to start out just by sort of giving the overview of why we're here and why we're talking about the issue of models of care for aging inmates um, in our correctional facilities. If you look at the um, if you look at the statistics out there, we have from 2007 to 2010, the number of older prisoners, 65 plus, increased by 63 percent, which, um, while the rest of the prison population only increased by about 0.7 percent. So you can see we have sort of an explosion, and that's over just a three-year period, and it's also taking into consideration only those 65 plus. Um, and we know that in the inmate population, aging is, you're really considered old or older by the time you're 50 to 55 because of all your com comorbidities, lifestyle, etc. So this looks at the 55 plus, so between 1995 and 2010, the number of inmates 55 and older quadrupled to 124,000 and nearly a quarter million inmates today are classified as 50 plus in federal and state prisons. So we're dealing with a lot of people and it's growing, it's increasing. We're, a lot of this is because mandatory sentencing, three strikes are out. Um, certainly we're also seeing the phenomena and I've been hearing a lot from people at the jails uh, at this meeting about the fact that they're seeing older guys coming and women coming into the jail system, maybe for the first time. That there's um, some in some states, there seems in some locales, there seems to be the practice of uh, looking back on cold cases now and going back and trying to find people that maybe um, offended, committed an offense 20 years ago, 30 years ago. These people are now old. They're finding them, they're bringing them into the jails and then ultimately sometimes into our prison system. So we actually do see older people coming into prison much more so than, than we have in the past. So we've got a lot of factors converging that are creating um, the need for us to be looking at what we're going to do about the older inmate. Um, and this is also a fact, this is from uh, just one state, but it's everyone recognizes that the younger offenders are cheaper than the older offenders to care for. So you're almost doubling your cost um, when you have an older offender because of health care costs and so forth with them. And we also know that our prisons are really not designed for frail older persons. And that's what we're having to deal with. What we've seen happening increasingly is when an inmate becomes much older, they become very frail, they become vulnerable, they maybe have dementia, they have all these things. For some time we've been using infirmaries, now everyone's finding their infirmaries are filling up, they don't, can't get the acute care people into the infirmary because all their beds are filling up with a lot more, those more needing long-term care and chronic care. So uh, we're really having to look at it. Today we're going to look at two different models. Um, there are a number of different models out there, but I think these are two interesting models. One which is developing programs within the walls of the institution, and another uh, is, is developing a nursing facility outside the institution, this community base. So I think it's, it's two interesting models to talk about. So I'm going to turn it over to Jennifer Turnage, who's with the state of Missouri, which with the Jefferson City Correctional Facility, a medium maximum security prison, and talk about the enhanced care unit. Hi. Um, like as she said, my name is Jennifer Turnage. I'm the institutional chief of mental health. Um, I run the mental health programming at our maximum security prison in Jefferson City. Um, I became involved in the enhanced care unit when um, the idea came about that we had an aging population that needed 
extra assistance. And so um, we kind of developed a team of people to um, help design this, and mental health was one of the key players in doing this. Um, so what we have done, here are some photos of uh, some of the, the, uh, the cells and the showers, the handicapped shower. Um, we at Jefferson City, what we did was we took um, a wing of one of the housing units and um, dedicated that as our enhanced care unit. Okay? What we, there were certain modifications that needed to be made. For example, back here on this picture, you'll notice that it's just a, a bunk. It's not, it's not a double bunk. What they did was they took the bunk beds and they took them apart and they put the both beds on the floor so that we could accommodate the elderly population who couldn't get up on the top bunks, okay? Um, and we modified that wing to accommodate the elderly population, uh, added uh, electrical outlets for people who were on O2 concentrators, things of that nature, um, put things on the floor, uh, and then we uh, hired other offenders called daily living assistants who came in and were essentially kind of a, a nurse's aide. Um, and it was a paid position. They actually live in the wing with the offenders that are assigned to the wing. And it's they receive 24 hour care um, by other offenders who are providing that care, okay? So some of the things that we provided for them to assist their need, not only just as in modifications to the, the actual physical living environment, but we had we incorporated other things as well, like the healthcare services. So one of the things that, that we did was nursing staff come into the wing every day and make rounds. Okay? They check in with each offender, make sure you know if they're having any health needs, any concerns that that medical would need to know about. Um, mental health is also involved in that. Mental health makes daily rounds, okay? Now, not all of the offenders are receiving mental health care, but part of the, it, it is to build a relationship, not only with the aging offenders who live in that unit, but also for the daily living assistants. Okay? Because oftentimes they require just as much emotional and uh, support as the offenders that they were taking care of. So mental health provides a service for them that you know they can come up to the, the the counselor and say you know look this is going on with this offender you know they haven't I can't get him in to take a shower I don't know what's going on you know these are kind of the things that are happening you have any idea what could be causing this that kind of a thing and mental health can listen to them give them um, some suggestions if there are any take their concerns to somebody else and it's just kind of a support for them. Um, as well as supporting the offenders. So going in and being there to just sit down and chat with them, make sure they're doing okay, kind of keeping an eye on, do they seem to be decompensating? Is there something here that maybe I need to let medical know about? Um, are they feeling depressed? Is, you know, just those kinds of things. So mental health also provides a daily check on that. Um, you know, we are also dealing with the diminished cognitive skills, which is really kind of a medical aspect, but because that doesn't fall under mental health care, but sometimes with offenders who um, are experiencing <coughs> dementia, Alzheimer's, there's that emotional piece that goes with that. And they can be, um, you know, they can get frustrated, they get angry, and not only dealing with that, but dealing with the offenders, the DLAs who are taking care of them. Sometimes that's very hard for them to deal with. Um, and so the unit is there so that, that we can help them to deal with their daily living needs. Okay, so we have the health care providers, medical, we have mental health services, we have your classification and your custody staff. We have special um, staff that we hired as corrections officers that are kind of assigned to that wing. There is a classification and a caseworker who is knowledgeable about that wing. What they do is they uh, adjust the, the work schedules for the DLAs. Um, they're assigned like a group, like each DLA has maybe five offenders on their caseload. That's switched out every week so that um, if you had a particularly difficult offender, um, you knew that you had them for a week and that you were gonna be able to move on to somebody else, 
Okay. So the c classification and custody staff took care of the work schedules. Um, you know, maintenance has had a lot to do. They've had a lot of modifications that they've needed to make to the wing. Um, and so we require their assistance in those needs. We have um, a kiosk that they can order, you know, their canteen from that was lowered so that if they were in a wheelchair, they could wheel up to it instead of having to stand. Um, so just those kinds of things were considerations that we made when implementing our enhanced care unit. Um, in regards to food service, um, we also implemented that when it gets to a certain temperature outside, I think it was 20 degrees, that they would not have to leave the housing unit to go to the dining room. Um, so meals can be brought to them to keep them from having to um, venture out in the very cold weather. We've had things such as um, lap blankets and things for them for the colder weather, uh, for those that are wheelchair bound. Um, so those kinds of modifications have been made and, um, and, and things, you know, that occur over time that you don't really realize at the moment. You know, we're always constantly making some kind of adjustments um, to the program. Uh, we have since we initially opened the first unit, we have taken another wing of the housing unit and we've opened up a second wing for that. And we chose the housing unit that was closest to the medical services building. And we did that on purpose because a lot of your elderly offenders, um, there's a lot of walking that needs to be done at the prison because of its size. And so we wanted to make sure that we picked the housing unit that was closest to all of the services as possible. Okay. So they are closest to the, the medical unit and um, the DLAs will walk with them, even if they're not wheelchair bound or they don't need a walker. Sometimes maybe they just have dementia. Just have someone to go with them just in case they maybe forget which housing unit they need to, to go back to or where they're going. And, and oftentimes what's interesting is that our, our daily living assistants often deal with, they help their offenders that they're taking care of deal with other inmates because obviously what we understand is that when an offender is diminished in some capacity that that makes them a target and we've had many situations where the DLA has had to step in and keep an, or try and moderate the situation where another offender may be trying to intimidate or extort one of the elderly offenders that's happened a lot in the, the dining room when it comes time, you know, I'm going to sit here and you're going to get up kind of a thing. Um, it's happened in the medication line. Um, so that's one of the things that the educational piece that we have to provide for the DLAs and the support that we can give them because that puts them in a very touchy situation to have to get involved in a situation that might be occurring between two other offenders. And so those are some of the things that we do for them. So to be in the our enhanced care unit you have to be 50 years old uh, maybe you might require continuous ox oxygen uh, being wheelchair bound just needing assistance with daily living activities you know our, our DLAs they go and they clean the cells for them because even if you can walk around maybe getting down on the floor is hard you know and and pulling your things out so they'll pull everything out of the cell they'll clean it real well put everything back and they'll take care of that for the elderly offenders, okay? Um, those with memory and or orientation, you know, another thing, service that, that they provide is that they socialize with them. You know, they, they may understand that they have memory and, and cognitive issues and part of the service they provide is just sitting with them, playing a game with them, trying to get them out of their cell because oftentimes with the dementia piece, they, they kind of go into their cell, they lay down and they lay all day. And so part of what they do is trying to engage them to get them out of their cell. Why don't you come out here and just sit with me at the table or, or let's, you know, why let's take a walk around the wing, do something like that. And so they're not only providing for their care, but they're also trying to socialize them so that they're just not laying all day long getting worse. Um, our offenders who are in the unit, um, they cannot pose a risk to the safety and security of the facility. There are certain offenders, elderly offenders, who may not qualify to be in the unit. 
Okay. If they have had uh, major conduct violations, um, if they've had, you know, uh, assaults upon other uh, other offenders or upon staff, um, those the serious major conduct violations. If it's been within the last several years, that's taken into consideration. We have had offenders whom we have put in our enhanced care unit, um, whom we've had to had to to kick out because they get in there and they they're a behavior problem. Um, we usually try and work with them. Oftentimes they get in there, something occurs, they are placed outside of the unit, um, given a time to be good. And then if they can do that, we've put them back in before um, to see if they can manage it again. So that is something that we're constantly having to, to keep an eye on because this is an environment that we want to be a safe haven for all of them. And, and so, uh, we we don't want those kinds of offenders who um, are going to take advantage of others. Sure. Well, you know, I mean, that's even the case with people like with like dementia and Alzheimer's. You know, it, it's there's a the examples that I can think of where that's happened is where. Um, we had an elderly offender who came up behind another guy in a wheelchair and he grabbed the handles and he like yanked it back okay we've had some things like that which at some point regardless of whether they have some kind of a brain issue going on there you have to weigh out that versus the safety of the other offenders and so there have been times where we have decided, you know what, it, this offender, we're gonna have to house them somewhere else. Well, if they're capable, because those that are in the enhanced care unit are not necessarily physically or mentally bad enough that they are required to be in the infirmary. So this housing unit that we have, we might take them out of that wing and just put them in a different wing in that housing unit. So they're still close to the services, but they might not be in there getting the intensive care that, that the others get. Um, sometimes they go to segregation if they've done something, you know, particularly that would require that. But, uh, but if they're bad enough, they go to the infirmary and, th and that's where they live. But at the enhanced care unit, the purpose of it was to try and empty the beds out of the infirmary for those that just had illnesses that could come in and go out or for those who were on hospice care. But sometimes, you know, you have someone with dementia that it's, if it's bad enough, they have to live there. So we're, we're kind of waiting on that. Uh-huh. It's interesting that you bring that up because we have a committee and the committee is composed of mental health, medical, and the caseworker or classification staff. And what we do is when people put in referrals, I think, you know, because it, it, maybe they're living in another housing unit on the camp and we just don't know them. So maybe a, a custody officer can put in a referral or they can come from other camps, other maximum security prisons in the state. Um, and so we look over them, we look at everything, all their medical, all their mental health, their their custody, uh, classification, and all of that, and then decide who, who gets put in. No. no, no, it's the committee, so it has to require the approval of the committee.
that's neat. I mean, you know, our, our daily living assistants, they, uh, they have like weekly or bi-weekly meetings with the, the caseworker and the housing unit, the functional unit manager, you know, essentially like staff meetings, you know, to address issues. Um, you know, because it is a paid position, so it's, a, it's an employment piece, so that piece needs to be taken care of. So they can bring, you know, concerns. We've obviously had um, daily living, living assistants that have needed to be um, fired because they were uh, extorting some of the offenders that they were taking care of. Um, you know, we've had that happen on a couple of occasions, so that's something that we always have to keep in mind as well, you know, that we're not, we are in prison, and we have to, even though we try and pick the daily living assistants that seem to have the the best record there or incarceration record but that doesn't necessarily mean that that everybody that you get is going to be um going to do the job and be kind and and do it as it's supposed to be done so we've had situations like that too and have to have to handle those as they come up so the people who can put in a referral is the custody staff okay classification um, medical staff, if the doctor or a nurse sees someone whom they think would benefit, they can do that. Mental health staff and worksite supervisors. So anybody basically who works at the institution can put in a referral. And like I said, those referrals come from not only our institution, but from other institutions as well. Um, up until just very recently, we were the only maximum security institution in the state of Missouri that had an enhanced care unit. I think they've since opened up another one. But so that meant that we were servicing all of the elderly offenders throughout the state. So we would get referrals from other prisons saying, you know, needing this service. And we have brought, brought other offenders in from outside prisons to, to fill beds, okay? And we've been able to open up another wing to do that so we can accommodate more. So the enhanced care, the, we have a committee, okay? which is the HSA, the Chief of Mental Health, and the Functional Unit Manager. I think mean, I already addressed that, but you know, we look at their medical, their mental health, their incarceration record, all of these things before deciding whether they need it. Because you know, I mean, we don't want to put someone in who is maybe mildly needs it because they will take up a bed that we could maybe later on get someone who has more severe issues and, and needs it worse somebody else so that's always like a balancing game that, that we've played well that you know that that's why the the health services administrator would be advised of that and would let us know that you know that's not necessarily a bit of information that you can just share with everyone um, because of the confidentiality of that but it doesn't matter whether they have an advanced directive or not I mean that that's not gonna that's not gonna affect our decision any in allowing them to, to come in. Um, we have currently we have kind of a, a situation where this is the first time this has happened where we have uh, within the last couple of months admitted an offender into the enhanced care unit who really only has mental health issues. Um, he doesn't have a lot of medical issues. In fact, he's a uh, one of our younger offenders. Um, but has benefited from just living in that wing and does require some care. It might not be that someone needs to go in and clean a cell for him, but because of his mental health issues, the severity of them, he um, is a target and kind of just needs the socialization piece and you know doesn't know how to get along well with others and, and just do that. So, so that's kind of a, a new admit that we've had as of late. So we're, we're trying to see how that is going to work out and what kind of success that we have with that. So our hope is, is that staff have to do less work, okay? Um, not only in just the, the physical work, but kind of in the, in the behavior, um, monitoring the behavior of offenders. Because the first line of defense is your DLAs. You know, they're the ones that are working closely with the offenders every day. And so they can oftentimes take care of some things that before would have come directly to their correction officer. Okay. So, and, and the offenders that are enrolled in the unit, they, you know, they develop relationships with the DLAs. Some they like, some they don't. You know, that's, that's how it works. And, and so they go to them 
for their first line of defense as opposed to having to go straight to the custody officer or to the classification staff. Okay? So that has, and it improves the atmosphere within the institution because they're getting their needs met okay, more than they were before. And it's decreasing their frustration and their fears and their worries of living in general population. Okay, they feel a little safer and all of that. And so the behavior problems that you would encounter with these offenders, maybe uh, it has decreased like protective custody, um, things like that, because your elderly offenders will claim protective custody because they fear the other offenders. And in, in a unit like this, they don't, they, that greatly decreases their contact with other offenders. Now they still are in contact with everyone. They still go to the dining room. They can still go to recreation. They still have contact. But if you have a DLA with you, that's going with you, and is around, they can, that's almost like a, a line of defense that they have for them, okay? So since we started the unit, we've kind of done some studies and realized that, that there's been some real benefits to it. First off, our conduct violations have reduced by 75%. Okay? Um, administrative segregation was reduced by 77. Protective custody reduced by 100%. We've not had any offenders who have gone into the enhanced care unit that have left and gone to protective custody. Okay? And our suicide watch has reduced by 100%. Um, you know, when you have mental health in the unit every day, even if it's just for 15 minutes to make that round, those rounds, um, you know, the DLAs let us know so and so's, you know, having some problems. So and so's, you know, son died. Did you know about that? So we can check in with them. You know, those kinds of things are occurring. And so we've not had any suicide watch orders for any of the offenders that have been placed in the enhanced care unit since its inception. Oh, well, yeah, definitely, because these are guys that. Um, you know, I can't tell you how many times I've had a DLA come up to me and say, so and so's not taking their medicine. And I can't get it, you know, I can't make them, obviously. And, and I, they don't dispense it, but they know that they have their medicine in their cell. And they can say, you know, it's four o'clock, it's time for you to take that. And, and so, you know, they can let mental health know, they can let the, medical, the nurse know that comes through and does checks. Um, and so, yeah, it has definitely helped with. Uh, you know, so-and-so's got something wrong with his foot. Okay, well, here, let's go, you know, I'll let somebody know, we'll take care of it. So it definitely has helped with those kinds of things. I mean, that was the whole goal of it, was to reduce in, in the infirmary beds and try and take care of them as much as we can in the housing units. I think that's it. Do you have any questions? Go ahead. You know, if, if an offender is, is bad enough that they can't take care of that mostly on their own, they're probably not in the enhanced care unit. Now, does that mean that we haven't had offenders who had accidents, had things like that take place? Obviously we have. And yes, the DLAs help to take care of that. Yes, they'll help them get their clothes changed, their bedding changed. You know, they might give them the washcloth to wipe themselves down. They're not going to actually be actually providing that. But they're going to be there and supervise and help them get it taken care of. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yes. We're actually going to be talking yep. about that in the next session, part yeah. two. We're going to be going over the curriculum. Yes, they live in they live in the wing with them. Well, however long they want to work there, however long they want to have that job. And there's some issues with that. Yeah. So we're living in the wing. Um, we do have women's institutions, and we do have um, one that is uh, at least trying to get it started. We're trying to get it in each classification level. We need one at a women's institution, and we need one at classification one through five. And, and so we're still working on that throughout the state. Yes. And we actually, because of the, the leveling of the different prisons, we're seeing, we're losing some of our DLAs because they are some of the ones that are, you know, hopefully gonna get out one day. And so they're going to lower level institutions 
and so we lose them that way. We're glad to lose them that way, but it does cause a lot of attrition and having to retrain and things like that. Uh, just a quick housekeeping. I'm going to pass these around since we're sponsored. We're sponsoring this particular program and the next one. Um, and it's a federal grant. We have to be able to show that we actually had people here <laughs> and we're teaching. And also, um, and there's a front back to the sheet. We'd really appreciate it if you would fill it out and leave it before you leave today. And if you're interested, we do a lot of programs on geriatrics, on palliative care, on all these things by ITV, by interactive televideo. And anywhere you have an interactive televideo, we can usually get into it. Um, if we have to deal with firewalls sometimes with the prisons, but we found we can do that. And we also provide them by webcast. So if you're interested in learning about what program and having a sent your brochures, we'll be glad to do that by, um, by email. So. Okay, our, <clears throat> our next speaker is uh, Kathleen Marin. I would say we have two sections to this. Uh, we have two sections to the program. We're going to be talking a little more about the curriculum, about the training we do, both with healthcare professionals in the settings around geriatrics and also with the DLAs uh, in the next session. And so we'd love it if you could stay and listen to that part of it too. And, and we are going to open that session up for a lot more discussion too, because we want to hear what you guys are all doing. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Kathy Maurer, Kathleen Maurer, from, uh, who is the medical director for the Connecticut Department of Corrections. And she's going to be talking about a relatively new model they've got for um, dealing with the older inmates that need uh, more intensive care. Thank you, Linda. And thank you all of you for staying here this afternoon. Um, I listened to a really, really good presentation this morning from the Tennessee folks, and they talked about reentry. And one of their biggest struggles was how to place elderly people when they're ready to leave or when they're ready to parole or, or as they said, reach their expiration date. And I thought, oh my God, that's the way it was for us. So um, we actually have built a, a, a pathway around that in Connecticut. And um, it, it hasn't been an easy pathway, but I think it's a pretty effective one. And I'm just gonna share with you how we, um, we basically set up an arrangement so that Connecticut has a privately run, uh, privately contracted nursing home that is completely non-custodial. It is not part of the De Department of Correction, and it is not in any way related to our facility. Uh, our facilities, our Department of Correction, and it is the place to which we are able to put our elderly, frail, um, disabled, and impaired individuals who are either releasing on parole, releasing from end of sentence, or qualify for one of our other release mechanisms. And I want to um, personally just thank Dr. Kerry Preston, who's already made some very good comments, and Mike Nicholson, both of them are from the Connecticut system. I'm just gonna invite them to contribute anything along the way that they think might, might aid in the discussion and, and uh, uh, explanation of our project. Kerry actually is from one of the major um, facilities. It's a mid to high level uh, facility, but a high level for medical care. So a number of our patients who qualify for nursing home placement come from Carrie's facility. So initially, I just want to introduce you a little bit to, uh, to our system so that you can see what our system is like and get a sense of it. We are not, we are not tiny, we are not big, we are kind of medium sized. As you know, um, this is our, this is our uh, mission statement and of course we are all primarily concerned about safety and security. <coughs> But the Connecticut Department of, of Correction also has an obligation to provide safe, se secure, and humane supervision 
and also to support restitution, rehabilitation, and, successfully, and successful community reintegration. This is um, our state, and this is the, the scatter of our facilities. Uh, our state's about an hour and a half driving north and south, and maybe about two hours driving east and west. It's small. We have 17 corrections facilities. This map also includes some of the central office, some of the administrative um, uh, area uh, offices, as well as um, the parole offices. But we have a total of 17, and I'm just going to point out have a pointer. No, I'm just going to point out where the nursing home is that I'm going to talk to you about. <laughs> you'll, you'll learn how that impacted the the uh, process. So this is a description of our various facilities and their, and their um, medical capabilities. And actually the only thing that I want to point out here is that we only have a few facilities that have high level infirmaries. One of them is We only have really a handful, one of our jails is pretty high level infirmary too, but we really only have a handful of facilities where we can house acutely ill patients. We have about 17 facilities, as I, well we have 17 facilities, we have about 30,000 inmates who move back and forth through our system every year, 17,000 at any, at any one time, we're a little over that right now I think, but it varies between 16.5 and 17.5. A um, thousand of them are women and 600 of them are kids. It's mostly African American, Hispanic, our, po uh, our population is. It's 95% male. The average age is 35 years. And about 85% uh, have a history of substance abuse. Probably very much like the populations of each one of your facilities. This is what our general age distribution looks like the highest peak between 30 and 45 years, um, pretty typical. Um, but a chunk out on that right end that's of concern to us and the piece before the one out on the right end, the, the 3,000 people who are between 46 and 60. If you look more closely at our inmates who are 60 and over, you see that we have, um, there's about 450 in our facilities who are at least 60 years old. We've got five inmates who are over 80. Our oldest inmate is 89. We have 50 some who are between 71 and 80 and 374 who are over s between 61 and 70. So we have an aging population and we have those curves are going to be moving to the right as we go out. So we, we, we everyone's pretty familiar with this um, issues involving the aging population. It's very difficult to find housing for releasing folks in this group. They're age disabled, typically they're completely disengaged from their families. And in the past, when we would find, when we would have someone like this who needed to be released either via parole or end of sentence, we would have to call every nursing home in the state and frequently could not find any way to, to a, any nursing home that would accept these patients. As you know, we have many more aged, as we're talking about, any, many more aged and disabled and cognitively impaired inmates, and they're taking up beds in our, in our uh, high acuity care infirmaries. We get people in the hospital, just general patients in the hospital, need to come to one of our infirmaries um, at when they're when they're released from the hospital and we don't have a bed because our beds are taken up by elderly people who really can't survive elsewhere in the facilities but do not require the acute high level of care that uh, we are that that infirmaries are designed to provide 
So we heard an, a very interesting discussion about the in-facility um, assisted living accommodations in Missouri. Um, and some uh, systems I know are building nursing home style um, uh, functions within their facilities. We actually did it somewhat differently. So we have a community-based, privately operated, skilled nursing facility that opened this last spring and we have been putting patients in there since that time. And I'm just going to give you a little bit of history about how we went about doing it. It turns out that our state mental health agency also has an issue of placement. We have a mental health uh, agency with a large state hospital, and the, the, the mental health agency is DEMAS, Department of Mental Health and Addiction Service, Services. And DEMAS had as much trouble placing their patients in the community as we did. Um, and so DEMAS and DOC teamed up along with very strong support from the governor's office and worked out a plan to provide a, a place in the community where we both could release people who we ha or discharge people who were, not, were no longer really qualified for our own institutions. Um, initially, we thought, well, look, let's look at a DOC facility or let's look at a DEMAS facility, upgrade it, and, and run our own nursing home. But it turned out that bringing our old facilities up to code, and we had clo recently closed a couple facilities, but bringing them up to code for a healthcare facility was not in the cards. There was just not enough money to do that. So we finally settled on the concept of, of um, publishing an RFI, which we did. A couple, you know, we just set out into the world, look, we're looking for this. Then um, about six months later, we published an RFP. And the RFP said we need a nursing home um, that will provide care for this group of people. We're prepared to pay a little bit more than, than the normal cost. And so is anybody interested? And actually two people um, were interested in providing that service, or at least exploring that service. One of them was more interested in the other and um, became our vendor. Uh, our vendor is, um, is, a, is a nursing home company that has uh, eight or nine other nursing homes in our state, knows all about doing the business of nursing care provision in the state of Connecticut, and I think that helped us out a lot because they were prepared for all the sort of barriers and bumps and so forth in the road that we were, we were inevitably going to run into. I wasn't prepared because I knew nothing about licensing nursing homes. Now I do, um, but but in any case, uh, we the guys, the people who responded and, and ultimately we negotiated the contract with were pretty savvy about nursing home care and about the state of Connecticut. So it is, as I said, a privately owned and operated skilled nursing facility. Very important concept because. Our intention is to have Medicaid pay for many of the residents in this, in this nursing home. And of course, Medicaid does not pay for inmates, but these folks are not inmates. This is a privately owned and operated skilled nursing facility, and the residents of this skilled nursing facility are no longer inmates. We ha it has 90 bed capacity, and it's, as I said, I pointed out before, it's located in Rocky Hill. Um, it's called 60 West, and it, it is in a suburb of Hartford. A nice suburb, frankly. Um, so, so we have the building, so what, how do we fill it? Um, Demas has, um, they, they don't really have a problem filling it um, because they wanted to discharge their folks out of their hospital anyway. For us, it's a little different. We have in existence, even prior to the nursing home, we have release mechanisms prior to EOS or parole for people who, um, who either require compassionate release or could qualify for compassionate release or medical release. Medical release is six months prognosis or less, and com compassionate release is having served half your sentence and you no longer pose a threat to um, public health or safety. <coughs> So those release mechanisms were extant in the 
uh, under the purview of the Board of Pardons and Parole. Part of this, um, wh what was necessary for this uh, nursing home, though, we thought, were in addition to getting legislation that authorized to do the nursing home, we also got legislation that authorized the commissioner at his or her discretion to release people. And the criteria are really much the same as the Board of Pardons and Parole criteria. One is a medical release, which is six months prognosis or, or less. And the other is no longer uh, posing a threat to health and safety. So there, there were two pieces of legislation that were required. One that allowed the department to actually issue the RFP and contract with a private vendor for a nursing home. The second one, which came in the next session, the first one was a couple of years ago, this last one was a year and something ago, um, which allowed the commissioner at his or her discretion to release patients into the nursing home. So um, the statutory language says the offender must require continuous palliative or end of life care. This is the, this is the commissioner's uh, discretionary authority or be physically incapable of preventing a danger presenting a danger to society and the process is and I'm going to go a little bit more into the process because it's pretty it's pretty comprehensive but basically the inmates selected for placement shall be based on the discretionary authority of the Commissioner of Correction in consultation with the medical director so the medical director who at this particular point in time is myself must approve the placement. In addition, there is language in the law that requires me to round on the patients at a, quote, reasonable interval and determine that they, know they still meet the criteria under which they were released. So if we have somebody that goes into the nursing home and becomes markedly better, that has not happened, but if in certain circumstances it would, then I have an obligation to inform the commissioner that the person has become markedly better and no longer meets the criteria of the release status. Yeah, um, these, by the way, these, each one of the people in this facility is supervised by our community supervision folks. So they, they don't have a standard, pr it, 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 the, the discretionary releases by the by the commissioner. Those do not have a standard parole status, but they are supervised by the, by the parole function within our unit. The other folks, assuming that they haven't reached DOS, the other folks, the ones that are released through the Board of Pardons and Parole, and there are a group, there are both in the nursing home now, they are in, on formal parole status and supervised by the same individual, but under the parole status. So. So I do want to tell you a little bit about the assessment process that we go through, because um, we're, we're very, very, very cautious about who gets into the nursing home for a lot of reasons. First of all, everybody who gets in, and this, this is kind of a no-brainer, you have to meet PASSAR um, standards, which is the Medicare process. It's called pre-admission screening and resident review. But Medicare has to approve the, the, the um, individual for to and set basically this process says they're appropriate for nursing home care skilled nursing uh, facility care after the pass are um, sort of uh, barriers crossed we our our department completes a full medical evaluation and an assessment of the criminogenic risk once that's done, there is a multidisciplinary committee that's actually run through the DEMAS side of the agents, uh, DEMAS side of the, of the nursing home. And they go out into the facilities, they see the candidates, they review the DOC assessments, and they look at, finally, an independent forensic psychi psychiatric assessment done on each one of these folks. It's a significant expenditure of resources to assess somebody to go into this nursing home. And then their recommendation goes to the Connecticut Department of uh, Correction Commissioner and the commissioner makes the final decision. So the challenges associated with this, um, first of all, um, you know, it, it, it wasn't an easy process to get it moving. We, we've worked on this for several years. Um, 
it has to be licensed. This nursing has to be, the home has to be licensed, meaning all state licensing and certification processes. So our health department had to license it. This was not an easy process, but the, we were very lucky because um, the team included health department uh, representatives, DEMAS reps, reps from our place, and a variety of other state agencies that had something to say. So although it wasn't easy, it wasn't all, there, there weren't obvious blocks along the way. It was just a struggle. Um, the, the reimbursement piece is still up in the air a little bit. The Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services who uh, pay the Medicaid bills um, have not yet determined whether or not people in this facility are going to qualify for Medicaid reimbursement. Our DSS, our own state services, social services agency, is definitely on board with this, uh, as is our governor's office. So, and, and the other thing about this is that if we were releasing these folks into any other nursing home in the state, they would get, as long as they qualified for Medicaid, they would be Medicaid reimbursed. These patients are exactly the same as all of the others. It's just that CMS needs a little time to think about it, I think. Um, the status of the nursing home is no different from any of the other nursing homes in the state. And although we weren't terribly successful at getting people into other nursing homes in the state, we have put in probably 10 or 12 over the last few years, something like that. And the other challenge is identifying, finding it, patients who are appropriate for placement. So, so we don't have an electronic health record. We don't have a formal way of identifying people who might be, uh, have dementia diagnoses of some sort, who might be um, paralyzed, who might be quadriplegic or paraplegic or whatever. So it's been somewhat of a struggle to identify who might be, who, who might qualify. Um, we do have, uh, we have a series, we have discharge planners on the medical side. We have, uh, who are able to look at people in our infirmaries and suggest them to us. We have reentry planners on the non-medical side who are able to, to point people who might be eligible out to us as well. But what we really need is a systematic process that enables us <coughs> to very clearly identify these people early on. So I just want to tell you, um, in, in July of 2012, this was one of the articles about the nursing home. And you'll kind of get a sense between this one and I'm going to show you a, another article that was uh, published in Connecticut in May of 2013. So the, the byline is state to allow inmates in nursing homes. And the first sentence, Connecticut's sickest state prison inmates will be released and moved to a nursing home early next year in an effort that state officials say will save millions of dollars in health care costs. The estimate is that this is going to save the state about five million dollars a year. But by May 2013, notice, first patients moving into controversial Rocky Hill nursing home. Um, basically, it, you know, what happened is the, the as you might expect, the, the company that, so, so the, the, uh, the company that got the contract, got the contract and, and had to find a nursing home. They did not own the nursing home at the time they got the contract. So they looked around and they actually got a really good deal on a vacant nursing home in Rocky Hill in the middle of a residential community. And, and that was somewhat controversial as you might um, imagine. But we have an extremely strong governor and a very courageous governor. And, and basically, um, Governor Malloy said, this is an important thing for, for our state and we're gonna push on, and, and we did. Uh, and so it's open now. We've had no incidents. We've got about 30 people in it now. The capacity is 90. The plan is to split the, the folks in the nursing home about 50-50 between DEMAS and our patients. The folks who run the nursing home prefer our patients to the DEMAS patients. They're easier to manage. They, they would rather have more corrections patients than DEMAS patients. Um, and we, I suspect within about the next year we will have it completely full. Um, this is what it looks like. It's, it's a beautiful nursing home, was completely rehabbed before. The, the company who used to own it um, went broke about two or three years ago. 
and right before they went broke, they totally rehabbed it. When I walked into it, when it was before it was open, and there were Hoyer lifts, brand new Hoyer lifts, sitting in closets, and and it was you know every bed was there, all the bedding was on the beds. It was very interesting, um, and it's a beautiful nursing home. It has it has solid oak uh, nursing stations. It's it's quite remarkable actually, um, and it turns out that our people do really well when they go there, which is a very nice thing. So that would be it. Any questions? Yes, sir. Mostly because they're coming from prisons. People. So um, the nursing homes say to us, um, if if my people, you know, if if the if the pe other people in the nursing home learn that we have a person who came out of prison, then they're not going to want to be in the nursing home, and their families are not going to want them to be in the nursing home. And I actually think that that's probably a very human response. Um, it's probably not legitimate because a lot of you know, it's like the Dem so let me just, I'll give you a few examples. So the Demas people who come from the state mental hospital into our nursing home, have any of those, do any of those folks have, have criminal records? Mm -hmm. do the, does the community care about them having a criminal record? No, because they're coming out of Demas. So it's, it's you know, it's a, it's human being perception, um, and, but it's very real. And we, we used to call every nursing home in the state to try to get a spot for people, especially the EOS folks. You know, so the other thing is that when people are ready for parole and they have X number of months or maybe even longer than that between parole and their end of sentence, the way it was, we could never release these folks prior to their end of sentence. So here you're, you're taking six months, a year, whatever additional time the people have to stay in facilities. Number one, they're not, they don't have any supervision um, then. They just go EOS. But it's also not an appropriate use of resources. So, yeah, it's a, it's an, it's, yeah. yeah. You would walk in and you would not know the difference. It's got a, it's got a secure ward for dementia patients. They did build a tall fence around the back. It's got, um, it's got a little back, so you walk in like this.